Google Doodles. I don't even know where to begin with this one. In my previous video going over the long and expansive lore of the Google Doodle universe, games, and characters, I wasn't expecting too much to come out of it, and I was proven completely wrong. Needless to say, the video absolutely exploded, and it's received over 1,500 comments with ideas ranging from the origins of the Magic Cat Academy, to the Great Google Doodle Ghost Stories, to the Candy Cup Witches, to the Doodle Champion Island Games, and beyond. If you haven't seen part 1 of the Google Doodle lore yet, you're probably going to want to watch that first because there's a lot of information in this video that won't make sense if you haven't seen it. I'm going to be saying this a lot, but I genuinely want to say thank you once again because the incredible response to part 1 has been beyond my wildest beliefs and you guys are the ones that make it happen. So, without further ado, let's take an even deeper dive into the Google Doodle lore. Right as I was starting to finalize the script for this video, just like celebrating Pani Puri, another big twist came to the Google Doodle lore. Only this time, it wasn't just with one singular doodle, it was with the whole archive website itself. On November 7th, 2023, the Google Doodle archive website underwent an entire overhaul, completely changing its stylization, search system, and even URL, going from google.com slash doodles to doodles.google instead. This doesn't mean a whole lot for the lore in general, but there were a few more connections that I could find. One big detail that was changed in the website was the 404 landing page, which you could find by just typing in nonsense after the new URL. Sure enough, making a presence yet another time is Momo the Cat. The page is labeled 404 error missing page, followed by Momo's head surrounded by a few shapes of the spells from her game. The last thing that I wanted to point out was towards the bottom of a page for each of the doodles, where there's a list of did you know given for the history of Google Doodles. After scrolling through some of the cards, we land on this one. Our most frequently recurring doodle character is Momo the Cat, named after a real-life team pet. As far as I could tell, this is the first official mention of how common Momo's appearances have been throughout the Doodleverse from the Doodle team themselves, so that's more funny to me than anything else. As for the updated stealth, I'm still getting used to some of the changes, and there's a few doodles that actually don't work with the new update, but I'm just still glad that Google cares about their doodles, enough to get a whole website revamp for them. Alright, remember when I said that a lot of the doodle lore was organized by Nate Swinehart, who's been at the company for nearly a decade? Well, I was pretty eager on October 2nd, 2023, when the Google Doodle celebrating the Appalachian Trail was released. The doodle is another slideshow doodle, and it's really similar to the Earth Day 2017 one. The description for the doodle reads, Today's slideshow doodle celebrates the Appalachian Trail. Click the doodle to explore the 2,190-mile footpath that spans 14 U.S. states. Doodle artist Nate Swinehart trekked to the Appalachian Trail to conduct research for today's doodle. Along with the photos that Google and Nate's Instagram showed, I was also able to find a TikTok on the official Google account that showcases more of Nate's travels as well. The Appalachian Trail doodle follows a tiny rock who sets out on the trail with accompanying facts and beautiful paintings of the environment in the background. Originally, I was a little bummed out that there didn't seem to be any lore in the doodle at all, but I didn't think too much about it given the fact that the vast majority of Google doodles aren't related to the lore at all. And that was until I revisited one of the slides in particular. On slide 6 out of 12, the description says that some of the many traditions around the trail include getting a trail name, greeting everyone you cross paths with, and eating a half gallon of ice cream at the trail's halfway point. The list of trail names is written in different handwritings and colors, so I think that each person that the rock met wrote their own name on the list. Let's look at the names. Doc, Scout, Lucky, Sunshine, Turtle, Sparky, Giggles, Rooster, and Patches. When I first saw the list of names, I didn't really think too much about it because Lucky isn't that uncommon of a nickname, and that was until I remembered that Lucky is the name of the second most important character in the series. Knowing Lucky, she was probably on her way to break the record for the fastest time to hike the entire trail. She's won the equivalent of seven Olympic medals in all different sports, so I wouldn't really put that past her. I was debating whether or not Lucky's name was just a coincidence, and then I kept reading the list. At that point, I was ready to write the name off as just a tiny reference or coincidence, but then I took one last look at the list, and there, halfway torn off at the bottom, Momo. Yes, I know that the last O is invisible, and yes, I know that the name could be something else, not necessarily Momo, but there's just no way that the name was put there and then torn out for no reason. Am I overthinking this? Absolutely. But it's there, and it's got meaning, so I'm including it, and I'm overanalyzing it. There's also a small diamond shape that's placed to Lucky's name. I'm not entirely sure about what it means, but given the fact that diamonds are considered lucky in most cultures of the world, this is probably just another reference to Lucky's name. If the Doodle actually is a part of the Doodleverse and Lucky and Momo were on the trail, this would be the first real-world location that's seen in the Doodleverse, which is an interesting development. But as small as it is, I'm just glad to see that the Doodle team is still putting in these little details for us. 
And also the term Doodleverse was coined by Cheese Your Chip 333, so thank you for that. I was going into the Halloween 2023 Doodle not really knowing what to expect, and when it finally came out, I was a little surprised by what I saw. The 2023 Halloween Doodle refers to itself as a storybook, and it's in almost identical format to the Celebrating the Appalachian Trail Doodle from earlier, with the vertical format and arrows on the side. I'm gonna read the poem that the doodle gives us first, and then go over the slides that we see. The moon is out, the wind is howling, it's time to make a scene. A year has passed, it's here at last, the night of Halloween. Go get your mask, put on your suit, it's time for us to scare. We'll walk and play some nighttime tricks, but only if you dare. Tonight is full of frights, I'm told, with pumpkins at their post. We'll see some monsters of all sorts, perhaps even a ghost. The lights are dimmed, the thrill is set, we walk along the street. Knock on a door, knock on the next, ask them trick or treat. When we're done, we'll head back home with bags full of sweets. We hope they'll last us to next year when this night repeats. Happy Halloween. I was a little dismayed that we didn't get something a little more for Halloween, but then I started noticing more and more of the little details that were thrown in. So let's start going through the slides. The first and last slides out of the 11 show an owl sitting on a branch with a few bats silhouetted by the moon. We've only really seen two owls before, Fukuro from the Champion Island games and Momo's classmate from Magic Hat Academy. This owl doesn't really look like either of them, but it does make me wonder why the doodle is bookended by the owl if it has significance of any kind. The next slide shows us a cat on a fence looking at a pumpkin from below. And basically this just cements two things into the lore. Momo is not the only black cat in existence, and pumpkins are just generally alive for whatever reason. Slides 3 and 4 show a group of trick-or-treaters going down the street, as well as a crow in the background and another character scaring them off. None of these characters look particularly familiar besides the Green Witch, but the costume doesn't look anything like the Green Witch that we're familiar with. Although there is one particularly animated crow sitting on the tree in the background, which I'll get to later. Slide 5 has more pumpkins and a haunted house in the background. If you look a little close in the house itself, you'll see that there's a ghost that takes a peek by the window and quickly hides. There's also two giant hands that pop out of the ground. The house does bear a little resemblance to Jinx's house from Jinx's Night Out, but the ghost doesn't look like him that much either. Slide 6 is just more trick-or-treaters in the forest, but slide 7 is where things start to get more interesting. There's a few trick-or-treaters in the background getting candy from a vampire, but if you've seen the doodle already, you probably know that I'm much more interested in the trick-or-treaters in the foreground. In the first group, there's a kid dressed up as a flower, two kids in a trench coat, and last but not least, Froggy himself, with a backpack and holding a leaf above his head, just like in the Doodle Champion Island games and the Bubble Tea Doodle. And then the second group walks by, with an astronaut, butterfly, or a fairy, and of course, to nobody's surprise, Momo the Cat. My favorite thing about her appearance is the candy holder, which actually has the same cat face as from Jinx's Night Out in Momo's previous trick-or-treating experience, so that's a really nice detail that was thrown in there. Slide 8 has one more familiar character appearance, with Lucky the cat being visible among the trick-or-treaters at the door. But there's something off about Lucky here. I mean, look at the edge of her head. This isn't Lucky the cat, this is someone dressed up as Lucky the cat. This was a little off-putting and jarring at first, but then I eventually realized that this could mean that the theory that Lucky and Momo becoming super popular after all the adventures would be true. I mean, why would a kid dress up as some random cat otherwise? On the archive page for the site, there's a quick sketch of the plans for the doodle, but they don't really contain any additional information that we haven't seen already. And a big shout out to Silas Height, because this background music is honestly one of the best Halloween tracks in the Google Doodle universe I've heard. People are now mad at this dual duel because you have raised everyone's expectations so much. Are you happy with yourself? Okay, this was just a drop in the bucket of disappointed lore followers that had some very choice words to say about the doodle. I mean, yeah, the doodle was a bit of a downgrade from some of the highlights that we've seen before, but from my lore influence bias perspective, I still think it's better than the 2019 and 2021 Halloween doodles. All in all, while it was a little disappointing, and I think that we were all looking forward to something a bit more substantial, I'm glad the team is still giving us these little lore bits with the recurring characters. I've talked with a few members of the team, and they're all really nice and genuinely passionate about their work. So here's to hoping that the story moves forward soon, hopefully before and during Halloween 2024. Alright, now that we've gone over the new doodles, the second section is going to go over the many, many things that I either missed, got wrong, or didn't really go over for part one, including your theories and ideas for the lore. I'm going to start off real quick by fixing some mispronunciations of mine. First and foremost, it's not Boab T. I don't know what I was saying there, it's Boba T. Also for this doodle, it's not pronounced Pani Puri, it's Pani Puri, so hopefully those are more accurate. 
Also, when I was describing the green candy cup witch, I mistakenly said that she's always with a book in her nose, and I completely butchered the phrase she's always got her nose in a book. Technically makes sense, but that's just the thing I wanted to get out of the way. And the most pointed out mispronunciation of mine is, of course, the abbreviation for what is known as the Graphics Interchange Format Image. This is obviously pronounced as GIF, GIF. so hopefully that settles it for everyone. Another mistake that I made was claiming that the Kappas on Champion Island were birds, when they're actually aquatic creatures from Japanese folklore who reside in bodies of water. Something tells me that the fully detailed Kappas were a little too intense for the Champion Island games, and I don't really blame the team. Also in the Doodle Champion Island games, Lucky doesn't pitch around the island, she warps around the island. I have no clue where I got pitch from, but warping is what the dog tells us in the boats. The sea creature in Magic Cat Academy 2 that gives us a shield that I wasn't able to identify is reportedly a comb jelly. And after looking at a few photos of the real-life comb jelly, we could be pretty sure that's what the game's showing. And there's a few comments about this next issue as well, where I talked about Momo possibly being the owner of the school due to the fact that Magic Cat Academy's description says that she rescues her school of magic. I don't really know what I was thinking at the time I wrote that part, because this is just a common way of saying that someone attends a school, like how Momo attends Magic Cat Academy. So this sentence isn't really a good indication of the ownership of the school at all. With those out of the way, speaking of the Magic Cat Academy, I received a lot of interesting theories about it from a few users. One of my favorites is this one. I have a theory that if Momo is not the owner of the Academy and is a freshman who has a connection to the owner, the owner could be the Green Witch from the Royal Candy Cup. Although the witch didn't win the cup, her answer in the if she wins question was, I'll start a collection of ancient manuscripts. And that ancient book used by the ghost in Magic Cat Academy, aside from other potential books, could be an ancient manuscript as well. Maybe the Green Witch was friends with the Yellow Witch? I'm not too sure, but it's fun to think about. This is honestly one of the best explanations of the possible origins of the Magic Cat Academy, and for a few good reasons. The opening cutscene and first level of the game outright take place in the library, showing us the books that have been collected so far. And this fits perfectly with the description of what the Green Witch would have done if she won the competition. The comment points out that even though the Green Witch didn't end up winning the competition, it's possible that she could have teamed up with the Yellow Witch or have done something else to create the school. We don't actually know if the witches have a good relationship with each other or how they really feel about each other at all, aside from the results of the competition where Yellow and Momo are seen celebrating. The hyper-competitive Red Witch is naturally super upset, the Blue Witch seemingly happy for Yellow, and the Green Witch has a bored look on her face. Regardless of whether the other witches actually ended up helping her out, Green's description of starting a collection of ancient manuscripts is just too fitting with the concept of Magic Cat Academy to ignore, so thanks to Penguin7224 for this great explanation. One of the most replayed bits of Part 1 was where I showed the Cat Ghost for Magic Cat Academy 1, which gives Momo back a life. I mentioned that there's two different ways that I saw the ghost, so here's an extremely poor drawing of the two different ways I saw it. The Cat Ghost was a little odd from the start, and several comments from the video pointed out that the ghost looks a lot like all of the Cat Ghosts on the green team for the Great Ghoul Duel. The biggest difference between their obvious green clear color change is the fact that Olive is holding a dead fish in her mouth, while the ghost in Magic Cat Academy doesn't have anything besides the heart floating above its head. If all of the Cat Ghost and Momo's helper in Magic Cat Academy were actually the same, this would be pretty substantial because this is the first ghost who we've seen actively going from being evil to nice. Jinx doesn't really count because he was nice from the start. However, I don't think that Olive is the Cat Ghost from Magic Cat Academy. Remember that this ghost only shows up when Momo loses a life, and when she regains it by defeating the Cat Ghost, it gets vaporized like all the rest. I, along with a few suggested comments, don't think that this ghost is being defeated like the rest because I think this is the ghost of Momo's life that she just lost. The cat ghost's ears and eyes are a lot closer to Momo's than Olive's as well, and the cat ghost is shaped a lot more like the other ghosts than the Great Ghoul Duel Ghosts, where the shape of the green team ghost is a lot rounder and softer than the sharp edges of the purple team. It also makes sense that this ghost, being one of Momo's lives, would be mad at Momo, but doesn't attack her like the rest. Staying with Magic Cat Academy, I was able to find one huge piece of lore that I haven't seen anywhere else on the internet, and I found it by poking around the official Google blog page which once in a while will showcase behind the scenes of other Google Doodles. So you could probably imagine my surprise when I stumbled across this article from 2016 about Magic Cat Academy called Saving Magic Cat Academy from Catastrophe. But there's something pretty different about this blog post compared to the descriptions we get on the official Magic Cat Academy page. While most of the information that we get about Magic Cat Academy is written in the third person, this article is an entirely different perspective in that it's written by Momo herself, labeled as a First Year Feline at Magic Cat Academy, Feline and Companion to Google Doodler Juliana Chen. Let's take a look at what Momo has to say about her own game. Hi, I'm Momo, a student at the illustrious Magic Cat Academy. Heading to class this morning, I thought it would just be like any other day. 
learn a few new spells, drink some milk, and hang out with my awesome animal and vegetable pals. To my Halloween horror, hundreds of angry ghosts have invaded the halls of my beloved school, for real. And now I ask you to join me to try your hand, or paw, at fending off these ghastly ghosts with today's Halloween Google Doodle. With a swipe of your paw, or should I say a wave of your hand, you can help turn these Halloween tricks into a real treat. But be warned, your spellcasting must be quick and precise. To send these ghouls into a tailspin, you must draw the symbols that appear above the ghost heads on your screen. That's not all. Show your friends who's the real expert at casting spells by sharing your score after your sorcery is complete. After all, Halloween festivities are always more fun with your full litter. We don't get very much new information from this, but this is the first time we've heard anything directly told to us from one of the Doodle characters. So let's take a look at some of the details. First of all, Momo outright tells us that she's a student at the Magic Cat Academy, so that settles the debate over whether she was a student or owner. And yes, if this is actually written from the perspective of Momo, this is just one more case of Momo being self-aware that she's in a game, which has already been proven more than once. Momo says that she was just expecting to hang out with her animal and vegetable friends at school, so that must mean that there's nothing particularly out of the ordinary with the pumpkin going to school. Those are pretty much all the new aspects of the lore that we've gotten from the article, but like I said before, it's nice to get some more information about the premise of Magic Cat Academy, especially from Momo the Cat herself. Staying with the topic of Magic Cat Academy, I got a lot of comments about the next theory, and I'm honestly kicking myself for not noticing this one myself, but here it is. I feel like the Golden Retriever in Magic Cat Academy is the Blue Witch's dog, if they had one. This is because the Blue Witch was said to love Golden Retrievers and the dog's robe had some blue on it. This is probably one of the most blatant and obvious lore references in the entire series that I miss, and I feel like it's essentially undeniable as well. Out of Momo and all her classmates, the dog is the only character that has a different color on their robes, with a small blue undershirt being visible underneath them. The same shirt can be seen in the Magic Cat Academy 2 cutscenes, as well as a few separate art pieces that were made by the MCA creators. Let's take a quick look at the Blue Witch's description again. Despite her humble, occasionally blurry beginnings, Blue is as cheerful as her glasses are big, and even managed to find some joy in her nearsightedness with the help of a sympathetic medieval craftsman. Even if she ends up losing her spectacles, crashing headlong into an unlucky crow and ending her race in a crumpled heap, she'd probably still have had a blast. I actually got it wrong when I said the description mentioned that Blue loves Golden Retrievers, because Golden Retrievers aren't mentioned until the Q&A section of the biography, where they're actually labeled as Blue's spirit animal. Hmm, spirit. Going off track for a minute, when I was creating this image encouraging you guys to give some of your own lore ideas, I used this photo of the Blue Witch in the corner. While I was staring at it, I started to realize that Blue's attire and background has plenty of stars surrounding it. Even her glasses are in the shape of stars, and this got me thinking about one particularly persistent other star that we've seen before. That's right, Mama's Blue Spellbook with the outline of a white star on the front. Alright, there's a lot of levels to this little observation. If it turns out that there is some connection between the Blue Witch and the Spellbook, then that would mean that it's almost guaranteed that the witches helped each other out to try and form the MCA. I can't really think of another way that Momo, the Yellow Witch's cat, would wind up with the book. Even the opening cutscene of Magic Cat Academy once again shows the characters surrounded by hundreds of books, going back to the ancient manuscripts that the Green Witch said she'd collect if she won the competition. Anyways, getting back on track with the Golden Retriever classmate in the blue shirt, we can be pretty certain that the dog in Magic Cat Academy bears some sort of significant relationship to the Blue Witch. I'm not entirely sure if that means that the Blue Witch owns the dog per se, but it's possible that they have a similar relationship as the Yellow Witch does with Momo. Because just like Momo, the dog acts much more like a human than an actual dog. So this brings us into our next theory, and this one's a doozy. Also, perhaps Momo is a shape changer of more than just a regular cat into wizard cat, and changed from the spider and also into the crow atop Lucky Scarecrow. I feel like the shape shifting might explain the human and animal links too. I think the design similarities between Momo and the spider ref are important to note as well. It's possible that Momo used her magic to transform herself into a spider so she wouldn't scare the ghosts. The first time I read these comments, I initially brushed them off as a wild claim that tied together the connections in kind of a nonsensical way. But the more I thought about it, the more sense it seemed to make. I took a closer look at the spider referee from the Great Gold Duel, and sure enough, there are a lot of really, really close design similarities that I missed before. Everything from the black coloring to even the spider referee's pointed tooth look really similar to other renditions of Momo that we've seen. Even the way that the spider referee's eyes close is the same as Momo's eyes, and the eye color itself is the same as Momo's as well. I also ended up taking another look at the crow that was mentioned, in the center of the corn maze map from the Great Ghoul Duel 2. And don't forget, this crow is placed right next to Lucky, with the exact same color scheme, again. If it's true that Momo can in fact shapeshift between different forms, including her normal cat form and wizard cat form, that would mean a pretty big difference in how we look at the lore regarding her. 
If this theory is true and the spider referee and Crow are actually a shape-shifted version of Momo the Cat herself, she'd have a much more prevailing presence in the two games than we originally thought. Going back to Nate Swinehart's Tumblr post about the game, where we get the most behind-the-scenes information, he claims that Momo the Cat was almost the referee for the games, with the sentence trailing off into the next one where he shows where the more obvious cameos from the past Halloween Doodle Stars are. The sentence is driving me a little insane because I can't tell if Nate is hinting at the spider referee being a shape-shifted Momo, or if their similarities are a genuine coincidence. This is a really fun theory that could also tell us some more information about the Great Ghoul Duel and Momo's influence with it. This comment is another one of those theories. I personally think that Momo designed the Great Ghoul Duel so that the ghost had time of year to be mischievous and playful instead of destroying the world. Several other comments also suggested that Momo could have possibly transformed into the spider referee to avoid scaring away the ghosts, which would have fit given her past of notoriously beating them up while in her cat form. And it's possible that our previous theories of the Great Ghoul Duel maps taking place near or even at the Magic Cat Academy make sense when you remember that the first cutscenes from the original game in which the ghosts turn the skull from seemingly normal into covered with cobwebs, dust, and breaking everything in sight within seconds, is exactly like the environment for the Great Ghoul Duel. This is where the next theory comes into play, where it's pointed out that since the Great Ghoul Duel only takes place on Halloween night, the ghosts might have some sort of reservation on that night to just have fun and mess around inside of the controlled bounds of the school. This would work well as both a way for the ghosts to satisfy their mischievous needs and Momo keeping them from wrecking everything in sight. Maybe they were just trying to improve the environment for the games, and making it spooky is just the way they roll. Although I'm not entirely sure about this theory either, given their specific desire for Momo's spellbook. Staying on the topic of the Great Ghoul Duel, let's move on to our next theory and talk about the ghouls next. I read a couple of comments pointing out that I use the words ghoul and ghost interchangeably, where it's ghosts that attack the MCA and ghouls that participate in the Great Ghoul Duel. However, it seems like Google uses them interchangeably as well, with the Halloween 2020 description reading that Momo must protect the ocean from the big boss ghost and its school of ghouls underwater. Anyway, going back to the ghouls, I've seen plenty of theories about them as well, mainly revolving around their color discrepancy and the celebrating bubble tea doodle compared to the great ghoul duel games. Most people suggest, and this is what I think as well, that the ghosts simply change their color or use body paint, or the ghost equivalent of body paint, whatever that is, while the games are in a session, going back to normal once they're done or whenever they're not playing. This would also mean that the timeline that I used at the end of part 1 could be slightly off, where the Great Ghoul Duel games are actually taking place before and after the Boba Tea game, and not necessarily far off into the future like I originally thought. All of that aging that we could have seen in the environments would have been done in a matter of seconds to prepare for the Great Ghoul Duel by the ghosts themselves, not over a long period of time like I originally thought. This would also explain the posters of the ghosts in the museum, as the whole area is set up for the ghosts and they're not just taking over some random location. And those last two theories could be argued as being a little far-fetched, but if they're true, it would explain a vast majority of the reasons that were left unanswered regarding Momo and the Great Ghoul Duel. Everything from the supposedly abandoned locations, to the photos on the walls, to the very purpose of the games themselves, all organized by Momo the Cat and possibly refereed and spectated by her as well. Keeping the topic on the Great Ghoul Duel, I was able to find some really high quality background images for both games. As of late, gameplay has been off and on with the Great Ghoul Duel 2 being really laggy and the original game still unavailable, but I'm just glad that the doodles are back and available to begin with. Anyways, with these high quality backgrounds, I was able to squeeze some more lore out of the game. One location that I don't really see that many people talk about at all is the waiting screen for joining a random game online. If you take a close look at those doors that where the ghosts come out of, and the four windows next to it, with two on each side, you'll notice that they bear some pretty significant resemblance to this section of the spooky mansion map, the ones with the photos of Momo Jinx and the candy cup witches on the wall. I mentioned this in part 1, but several comments pointed out that the intro cutscene to Magic Cat Academy 1 and the mansion and library maps look really, really, really similar, a lot more than I initially realized. After all, let's not forget that the Magic Cat Academy likely got its start off books. The corn maze map had entire animals that I never even noticed playing the game, hiding in the corn and additional crows seen across the level. One thing that I never mentioned on the archive page for the Great Ghoul Duel 2 are the tiny doodles of the characters that are placed in between the game's credits. This one has Jade and Plum posing together and the cardboard cutouts of Momo and a corn cob together, with sunflowers in the background. At first I was really confused by the sunflowers until I noticed that they're actually in the background of the maze game, which is a detail that I never noticed while playing it myself. But one of the things I was looking forward to the most was in the museum map, towards the top where there's those photos on the wall that I wasn't able to make out in part 1. Alright, here's the big reveal of what some of them are. You guys will never see this coming. It's Mubba the Cat. This is like the 11th or 12th time she showed up, I've stopped counting. But she's wearing something else in this painting, and I can't really tell what it is. 
It looks like some kind of vampire costume, but I'm not able to tell. The picture in the upper middle is a landscape painting of a building with bats and a crescent moon. There's a visible circular window with perpendicular lines in the middle, not unlike the circular window that's seen in the waiting screen in the spooky mansion map. Is this the mansion? I think so. The green and purple bases each have a picture of flowers and the ghosts themselves as well. There's also a small piece of candy and something else that I still can't quite make out visible. And that final painting on the wall is a still life of a pumpkin. Towards the bottom part of the map, on the green side, there's more books on a shelf, a table display with a few different items on it, and jerseys for the two great ghoul duel teams. There's a cash register in the corner. They are selling merchandise of the great ghoul duel in the museum. But not even this was the biggest reveal from the museum map. There are two open books on display inside glass cases as well, and if you zoom in really, really, really close on the open pages, there's a very clear outline of a ghost on them. At this point, I'm pretty sure that the entire museum itself is just dedicated to these ghosts. Between these, the merch, and the outright portraits of each team on the wall, it's pretty much undeniable. In those tiny doodles that I mentioned earlier, the ghosts are even seen interacting with different pieces of the museum, with the hand ghost being scared of the hand coming out of the candy bowl, and Moss and Mob looking at the team-based paintings. Mulberry and Olive are seen poking around the pumpkins in the corn maze map as well, with some of them even reacting to their presence. If there's any overall lore to glean from these great ghoul duel maps, besides throwing in more connections between the games, it's that there's a lot more depth to these ghouls than one would initially assume. After all, the two ghouls who are sworn enemies are seen just hanging out together, and there's even merch being sold to the great ghoul duel in universe. We'll come back to this later. For now, let's move on to the next batch of theories, this time revolving around the Earth Day trio in Earth Day 2017. And if you thought there were darker elements to the Doodleverse before, I'll let this one play out for itself. At the deli of the store, there's a photo of a chicken available. And one slide later, there's an actual chicken riding the bus. Okay, this has gone from being filled with a lot of lore to being extremely concerning very quickly. I mean, these slides are right next to each other in the Doodle, so what's going on here? Well, beyond being concerning and outright cannibalistic, there's not really any definite lore connections I could take away from this besides the fact that society might be more than a little messed up in the city where the Earth Day 2017 Doodle takes place. I really, really hope we get an explanation for that little detail in the future because I don't think it was an accident, but I can't be sure. Alright, moving on to some of the more pleasant theories, a few people pointed out to me that it's possible the Doodleverse actually goes back even earlier than the Candy Cup game in October 2015, specifically referring to the Thanksgiving 2013 Doodle. Similar to Jinx's Night Out, this is an animated short that was posted on YouTube. Here's our description. As a motley crew of woodland creatures joins together for a Thanksgiving feast, a fox learns that everyone has something they can bring to the table. The fox, whose name we still don't know, is seen waking up in the forest and joining the crew, and then playing the banjo after realizing that he doesn't have any food to offer, but everyone has something they can bring to the table. Looking between the design of the fox in Jinx's Night Out and the Thanksgiving Doodle, there's some obvious resemblance between the two to the point that it's more than likely the designs aren't a coincidence. There's not a whole lot of lore connections that we can get from knowing that the fox is possibly the same one, besides making the Doodleverse nearly 10 years old at this point, and showing us a few more of the living situations for the animals. Assuming that the two Doodles are actually connected by the fox, this, these animals in the forest seem to have adapted to more wildlife than those in the city. Let's go back to Jinx's Night Out, because there's a few theories and comments that I received about the short film that really interested me. One of the first mistakes that I made was saying that there were no depictions of the Candy Cup Witches in the short film at all, and after I said that Momo was dressed up as the Yellow Witch five seconds before. Going back to the theories, I received a few comments suggesting that the environment that the Candy Cup took place in looks really similar to the area in Jinx's Night Out, which I could see. The limited number of neighborhood views that we get from the short film are definitely more modern than the environment in the Candy Cup, but then again we can't be sure of when the Candy Cup takes place either. Like we covered in part 1, the Candy Cup time period is essentially impossible to determine, with a mix of sympathetic medieval craftsmen and power lines in the background being just one of the issues with the timing. However, there are a few of the houses that bear some slight resemblance to those that are seen in Jinx's Night Out. Let's talk some more about the background of the original Candy Cup, which is something that I didn't devote a whole lot of time to in the original video. Beyond the houses and scarecrows which we originally talked about, the other two sections of the game that have the lollipops and chocolate bars are a little different. The lollipop section appears to take place in an area that has much bigger houses, some of which even have occupants peering at us from the windows. Lots of cats are seen around the area as well, and a few of these houses don't look unlike the loading screen for the Great Ghoul Duel either. In the graveyard section, I never even talked about the obstacles that the witches face. There's a few odd-looking gravestones as well, with massive cat statues being placed on top of a few of them. Another orange cat with a crown is seen next to the castle in the first, along with a few others scattered around in the backgrounds. Cats are definitely a lot more prevalent in the game than I originally thought.
<laughs> Alright, let's move on again to the next few theories, this time back to the Magic Cat Academy and Great Gold Duel games. I managed to find a Twitter thread from Juliana Chen, aka 5 Paninis, when the Magic Cat Academy 2 Doodle was released. It features some additional behind the scenes, more than is shown in the behind the scenes on the official Google Doodle page. I managed to find this screenshot of the Google Doodle Twitter account, and I just gotta give props to Juliana because matching up the banner and profile picture like that is really, really clever. We also get to find out more about Sugar the Cat. Her actual name is Captain Sugar, and she's not a mermaid either. She's a cat-shark hybrid in the game, according to Juliana. Also found in the thread is more deleted concepts and end screens, including one which is pointed out by this comment. Fun fact, there was a different game over screen for Magic Cat Academy 2 where ghosts overtook the ocean and stuff, but it was removed for being a bit too creepy. There's two different versions of the end screen in question, one for if you lose on levels 1 to 4, and one if you lose on level 5. And I could definitely understand why they wouldn't want to be showing this image to millions of children across the internet. Also seen in the thread are a few different storyboards for possible intros and end scenes, and even Juliana points out herself that it's nice to see Momo's classmates finally doing something for once in a different storyboard for when Froggy casts a spell. The last photo in the thread is this, which I just felt obligated to share, like this needed to be in the video. Let's move on from the Magic Cat Academy games for now and move back to the Doodle Champion Island games, which had plenty of lore, some of it within itself, that I didn't even mention in part 1. One of the characters who tells Lucky where Momo the Trophy Master is located is one of only four cats on the island in total. Lucky and Momo are of course the first two. The third one is the train station worker, who was inspired from a real cat named Tama who became famous in Japan after saving a train station or being shut down. Tama even has her own Google Doodle from 2017 honoring her. The last cat on the island is named Calvin, and he is a bit of an oddball. Towards the end of the game, when Lucky is trying to find Momo the Trophy Master, the lion statues tell her to think if she's seen any other cats on the island, to which she replies she has. If you stop by the train station first and talk with Tama, she says that the only other cat she knows on the island is Calvin, and he's the sleeping cat on Only Island. When you wake him up earlier in the game, he gives some weird information about his past. After you wake Calvin up from his sleep, he asks if Lucky has been sent by his coach. Calvin then says that he's the chosen one, and that he's meant to defeat all the champions and restore balance to the island, but the lava flows on Oni Island were just too comfortable for him to leave. Lucky asks if he wants to team up and compete with her, but Calvin says that the island isn't big enough for two chosen ones. Calvin's an interesting character because he makes us wonder if Lucky is really the chosen one, as the opening game cutscene claims she is. And as we find out, this isn't the case at all, as the two lions who greeted Lucky when she first arrived at the island reveal to her when she leaves that they just entirely made up the chosen one thing to try and motivate her, which ended up working out. But it makes us wonder if Calvin was told the same thing when he arrived on the island long ago, and this is honestly a little tragic considering the fact that he hasn't even left since he arrived, which is implied to be at least four years because that's how often the Champion Island games take place. That helps narrow down the when of the Doodle Champion Island games, but let's talk more about the where. This revolves around one character in particular, the pangolin from the Doodle Pangolin Love. I only briefly talked about this doodle in part 1, and as it turns out, it's got plenty of fans as well. Ooh, I see. Here's the secret page. <gasps> no! What? What? So let's go over it real fast. Pangolin Love was released over a four day span for Valentine's Day 2017 where we play as an enamored red pangolin who travels across the world to meet their partner. Along each stop, we collect items to learn new skills and make presents for the purple pangolin, which include baking, singing, dancing, and making a bouquet of flowers. The four levels of the game take place in Ghana, India, China, and the Philippines, where the two pangolins finally meet up with each other on the beach and discover that the greatest form of love that they have is each other. The game's ending scene follows the two pangolins back through the journey which we went on, finally ending back in Ghana where we originally started. The two pangolins fall asleep under the starry night sky, and the game ends. The red pangolin for the Doodle Champion Island games is found on the Secret Marathon Beach, which can be accessed if Lucky goes to the climbing, archery, rugby, archery, climbing, skateboarding, and marathon regions of the game in that order. It's a bit of a tall side quest. The pangolin that's found on the beach appears to be wearing some sort of purple track uniform like a few of the other marathon runners. The pangolin says to Lucky, oh, don't mind me. I'm just waiting here for someone special. If you'll recall from part 1, we talked about this connection of lore for a different trophy for Lucky, which is to retrieve a book that's owned by Olive the Otter. Olive is really, really stressed while she's talking to Lucky. Lucky finds the book in the bookstore, go figure, and finds a note inside that reads, My love, how I miss your face. Meet me at the secret beach tonight, alone. Now, I had a few people point out that the Pangolin Love game could have actually taken place after the Champion Island games, and that's where the purple pangolin who we're used to comes into play. But then again, the pangolin's own game is seen in the arcade section, which means that it must have taken place in the past. 
So there might be some bad news for everyone who was a fan of the original Pangol and Love Couple. I'm holding out hope that this was just an oversight, but it's a pretty glaring mistake if that's all it is. There's another part of Pangol and Love that I didn't find out until recently. If you're able to get every single cocoa bean, music note, ribbon, and flower, also known as 100%ing the game, you're actually able to get secret easter egg loading screens which feature the pangolin with all the artists and programmers for the game, which was another one of those images that just needed to be in this video. I couldn't not include this. Alright, let's get back on track with location. The final level of pangolin love takes place on a beach in the Philippines, and the pangolin is seen in the beach on Champion Island. Does that mean Champion Island is located around the Philippines? Personally, I don't think so, mainly because the games were made for the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, and there's a few distinctly Japanese culture references as well, like all the sport bosses and the whole stylization of the game itself with the anime cutscenes. So with that information, it's hard to determine whether or not the pangolin's appearance could have actually had a say in determining the location of the island. I'm personally going to say no to this theory just because everything about Champion Island screams Japan in our faces, and the Pangolin has gone through a lot of changes since the Pangolin love. Let's talk some more about the Champion Island games, which have a lot of smaller details that I didn't mention in part 1. A few comments pointed out the fact that given the inclusion of the arcade games, my original timeline that I used in the video might not be correct. And yeah, I gotta say this was a little bit of a curveball going back to the games. The inclusion of games like the Great Ghoul Duel means that it must have taken place before the Champion Island games and not after them like I originally thought. However, this is just the case for the Great Ghoul Duel and not the Great Ghoul Duel 2 since it hadn't come out yet, so it's still possible that the GDD2 takes place after the Champion Island games. Something that I mentioned but didn't talk about much in part 1 was the Magic Cat Academy, the Adventures of Momo book that's found in the library. An anthology going off Wikipedia is a collection of literary works that are chosen by the compiler, so if we're putting that into the context of a Magic Cat Academy anthology, I'd assume that each chapter of the anthology would be one of the Magic Cat Academy games, or as the book puts it, the adventure that Momo has. This could suggest that there's a relatively big time gap between Magic Cat Academy 2 and the Doodle Champion Island games. However, I don't think this is the case given that Momo mentions that her Trophy Master hustle is more of a side thing, with her main gig implied to be studying at her school. It's called Magic Cat Academy for a reason. Let's go from Momo to Lucky. There's plenty of different times that Lucky's name in particular is mentioned around the island, which obviously makes sense, but the ones that I'm talking about are a bit weirder than the rest. Remember that smart Kappa? Well, at the end of his long and rambling speech about how meaningless life seems, his last words to Lucky are, Please, enjoy your games. You've no idea how lucky you really are. There's just something about the way this line is written as the last one following the speech that gives me the sense that there's something more that meets the eye here. Like, is the Kappa trying to warn her that she's in a game? If so, why didn't he just flat out say it? The next time that Lucky's name appears in a weird spot is after she's sailing away from the island in the end credits, where they tell us to keep being lucky. I'm not 100% sure what this means at all, but I think it's suggesting that Lucky could return to her own game again sometime. It's hard to say for sure. The last name that Lucky's name appears again was given to me by a few different comments, and it's found underneath the Doodle's description. The second paragraph reads, Are you feline Lucky? Click on today's Doodle, join one of the four color teams to contribute to the real-time global leaderboard, and let the games begin. This was pointed out to me to be a reference to the famous I'm feeling lucky button that appears on the Google homepage next to the search button. Combine that with the fact that calico cats are considered good luck in Japan, and the origins of Lucky's name are pretty much certain. The next part of the Champion Islands that I wanted to talk about actually branches off into a bunch of other theories at once, and is centered around who else but Momo the Cat. When we go back into the boat in the Northwest Docks before completing all other trophies, it's just a random block of water that's placed into the ship. Lucky can even walk on the water, and the players left to wonder about its significance until the big reveal at the end of the game. Having a whirlpool at the bottom of the ship is an oxymoron in of itself. Like, how is the ship even able to stay afloat? Yes, obviously it's a video game, but the nerd in me is screaming at the screen. Anyway, as we know, after discovering that the Trophy Master is an imposter, Lucky talks with Calvin and heads back to the boats, where the former block of water has now transformed into the whirlpool that we're used to. The whirlpool itself is a bit of an odd concept, because when we get to see it in the ship, it's got a few streaks of color from the screen of the computer that Momo's using. However, I'm more curious about the environment that Momo has found in itself. The option that's picked when Lucky goes into the whirlpool is dive in, and Lucky comments on how weird it would be for the Trophy Master to be down there since cats hate water although Lucky was handling herself just fine with the aquatic dancing spore earlier. Not only was she handling herself fine with the aquatic dancing game with a scuba mask, 
But in the two water cutscenes, she doesn't even need a mask. She just goes down there with nothing to help her breathe. One of two things could be happening here. Number one, Lucky is simply the ultimate boss of every sport that has been or will be conceived, and the act of breathing is simply unnecessary for her. Or number two, the water around Champion Island behaves differently than normal water. At this point, anything kind of goes. When Lucky eventually does jump in, the entire environment under the ship is completely bare in Spare Momo and the computer. Lucky doesn't appear to be swimming under the water, and with the addition of the functioning computer, I'm pretty sure that the environment that the two are in isn't actually underwater. Or, if it is, there's a bubble of air surrounding them. Pretty similar to the entire premise of Magic Cat Academy 2, with Momo's air bubble spell from Froggy. Something that I didn't mention earlier that happens after Momo leaves the whirlpool is the fact that Lucky can actually interact with the computer, becoming shocked when she realizes that she's on its screen. Since we know that Momo is still playing the game and she hasn't finished it yet, I'm pretty sure that from Lucky's point of view, she's seeing the screen that we're looking at on the computer, like an infinite recursion loop where zooming in on the computer would lead back to the same room. Good on Lucky for not ending up in that existential quandary. Another weird detail about this interaction a little prior is when Momo is talking with Lucky when they first meet, and shocked that she's met THE Lucky from the Champion Island games, and she remarks that she's been playing it for days. This is a little weird because both the Champion Island greeters and Calvin tell us that Momo hasn't been seen for months, not days. This matches up with when Momo says that she lost track of time, but it's just bizarre to me that Momo has been playing Lucky's game for months. I can't say for sure what it means, but there's something about this little time rift that doesn't sit quite right with me. Let's try to tie this back to the story of how Momo might have ended up on Champion Island to begin with. There's plenty of comments with ideas about how this might have happened, and it gets pretty deep as well. Here's one with a couple different theories. Idea 1. All Doodle characters can travel freely between Doodle Worlds and the real world, in some cases breaking the fourth wall like they do on Champion Island. Idea 2. The only characters that can travel freely between the worlds are Momo and her friends thanks to Momo's spellbook. That's why we see characters like Froggy and Lucky recurring alongside Momo so often, and how we can see them interacting with humans outside of the Doodle Worlds and in the real world. This is definitely one of the possible explanations that can be used to show why sometimes the characters are seen in all animal environments, while other times are seen around humans, which only happens three times. The Candy Cup Witches, a few humans in the Doodle Champion Island games, and Pani Puri. Although I am curious who opened the door for the trick-or-treaters in Jinx's Night Out. But going back to the different worlds theory, I'm definitely not going to just throw this one out, because if we've learned anything from Momo and the Magic Cat Academy games, it's that Momo and the Spellbook are a force to be reckoned with. My personal theory is the whirlpool that Momo creates has to do with the traveling between different worlds, maybe like a portal or a wormhole. This both works as an explanation for the animal versus human worlds and the whirlpool underneath the ship, and the idea that the spellbook is what gives Momo the ability to do this makes sense when we remember that there's only a few characters that we've seen interact with others from different doodles at once, and every single one of them is shown to have some sort of relationship with Momo or shares a doodle with her. Let's talk some more about the ship that Momo's found in itself. I mentioned in part 1 that I didn't think the ship we find Momo in is Sugar Ship because of the massive design differences, but there are two things that I miss with this. This comment pointed out that Sugar Ship is completely destroyed in the opening cutscene of the Magic Cat Academy 2 game, and Sugar possibly just got a new one. I was thinking this to be the case for a while until I remembered that the ship wasn't completely destroyed, and is seen in levels 4 and 5 functioning relatively okay. It seemed completely fine and looking better than ever in the windscreen, so honestly, I don't really know what's up with the ship in the Doodle Champion Island games. Maybe Sugar just owns two boats or something. For now, the ownership of the boat is kind of in the air, but I guess it's likely Momo or Sugar themselves. Alright, let's take a step back from the Champion Island games and take a look at some of the smaller details of the individual games which I missed, starting with the hats from the Great Ghoul Duel 2. I mentioned the Momo Thinking Cap and the 2016 Doodle Fruit Game hat, but there's a few more that are actually connected to previous doodles that I missed. The first one, which I'm kicking myself for missing, is the purple pirate hat with the yellow outline and skull. The official achievement is listed as the Deep Sea Tricorn. Hmm, Deep Sea. And if you'll recall, the Weather Fox costume from Jinx's Night Out back in 2017 was the exact same pirate costume and hat, with a few key differences. The hat that Froggy wears in the short film looks much newer compared to the hat that we see in the game, with its edges and colors looking much more tattered and faded than in the film. But the biggest difference of all is the center of the hat. When Froggy wears it, it's go figure, the outline of a frog. But in the game, I don't think that's a skull at all. I think that's a ghost. I'm telling you, this universe goes so, so much deeper than we thought. The next hats that seem to have a connection to the GCU are the Witch Hat and the Pumpkin. The Witch Hat, whose achievement is called Witch's Brim, is seen in Jinx's Night Out once again, being Jinx's hat that they use to go out and dress as the witch. Jinx's hat is seen as being pretty smooth and in relatively good condition in the short, which is not the case with the hat in the Great Ghoul Duel, but they share the same buckle and colors, so I'm pretty sure that they're the same hat. 
The second hat that I didn't mention is the pumpkin hat, which a few people pointed out looks really similar to Momo's pumpkin classmate. I don't think this is a depiction of the pumpkin classmate specifically because this is just a common symbol of Halloween. The achievement is called Lantern O Jack instead of Jack O Lantern, so hey, maybe that's the pumpkin's name. It'd be fitting for sure. I mentioned these before, but speaking of pumpkins, in the behind the scenes section of the corn maze map for the Great Ghoul Duel, the pumpkins that we're able to see actually have eyes. Now I'm just wondering why Momo's pumpkin classmate has limbs. There's a few more hats that I've seen that seem to have a connection to the Google Doodle universe, although two of them only show up for a half second, and one of the other ones doesn't show up in the universe technically at all. Let's start off with a knight hat, which is called the Knight's Helm of Honor. Remember Jinx's night out when Jinx goes through the rapid fire costume collection before finally landing on the sheet? That's right, one of Jinx's costumes is, you guessed it, a knight. The helmet that's seen in Jinx's night out has some slight variations with the helmet that's seen in the game, but the similarities are pretty much undeniable. I mean, the feather, the coloring of it, come on. If this isn't meant to be a direct copy of Jinx's helmet, it's gotta be at least some sort of remake. And did you see this little detail in the museum map for the Great Ghoul Duel 2? This isn't the only hat in the costume arsenal that's got a reference either. A few costumes prior, Jinx is seen in a different costume, this time taking the form of a UFO and wearing a green alien headband. You could probably guess that a similar hat is seen in the Great Ghoul Duel 2, this achievement being called the Otherworldly Antenna. And these two together offer kind of a whole new look at the lore as we know it. Really quick before I get to those, I want to talk about the last hat, the Newbie Beanie, which is earned when the player plays 10 games. The title Newbie Beanie got me thinking, and the more I looked at the propeller hat, the more I thought I'd seen it before. And as it turns out, I had. When a person starts working at Google for the first time, they're often referred to as Nooglers, and given, you guessed it, a red, yellow, and blue propeller hat with a green brim. When it comes to trying to tie these hats back into the lore, there's a few different ways we could take it. One of them, which is the one I believe is true, is that Jinx either loaned or just gave some of the old hats to the ghosts to use when they got their achievements after he bridged the gap between the ghosts and everyone else. Another possibility is that Jinx's old house has been visited by other ghosts in the past, and they used the costume hats that they happened to find in the house for duels. Whatever the case, it's super interesting to see the connection between these hats is a lot deeper than I originally assumed, even including references to real-life Google employees. This isn't even the only reference to real-life Google elements either. One of Jinx's costumes is of an orange rubber guy, whose identity was speculated from the orange animator vs. animation stickman to Kenny McCormick. But I think this is actually the Google Maps Street View guy, which you drag onto the map to go into Street View. It turns out that he has a name too, Pegman. He has his own lore. To quickly wrap this hat and costume section up, like I just said, there's a whole lot more going here with the hats, the Great Ghoul Duel, and Jinx as a whole. We know that there is a big relationship between them already, but this is just kind of adding to that significance. I was curious about Lucky Speed when running the 400 meter race on the Marathon Beach section on Champion Island. For the record, the first place time for the 400 meter place is 43.03 seconds. If you can avoid getting hit at all and stay on the path for the entire length of the race, Lucky ends up winning the race in 35 seconds. Clearly Olympic track runners need to take up Naruto running. Alright, this next little detail that I was told about is probably my favorite of the entire Doodleverse. Like, out of every single little thing that the people of the Doodle team have put into this, I would say that this might be my favorite. In part 1, I mentioned how a few of the characters in Celebrating Bubble Tea each received a boba straw that had something to do with their color, specifically the last two, with Momo getting a purple straw and Lucky getting an orange one. But I didn't really talk about the straws for the ghosts at all, which is where this comes in. Not only are the straws all green, but each straw that the ghost gets corresponds to their name. Jade, Sage, Kelly, and Olive each get a slightly different shade of green, with Olive's being the most obvious difference. Sure enough, taking an olive green color. It's the things like this that make finding all this lore worth it, because there are a good amount of people who have put real love and care into this massive project, and being able to piece it all together and share it with you all is genuinely heartwarming. For now, let's go over some more of the smaller details that are in the doodles, this time with celebrating Pani Puri. As a group of customers goes by, with about a dozen customers in total, Momo and Lucky are once again being the small exception to that rule. Not only are they the only animals in the group, but there's one other small detail that the comments pointed out. The two of them aren't looking at the two that are making the Pani Puri, Panit and Pornima. Instead, they're looking down, where the player is selecting the Pani Puri to give them. Momo and Lucky are the only ones like this, not even Froggy, or whatever's on the girl's backpack, is looking down towards the food. Every single one of them is looking to the right, so why wouldn't Momo and Lucky be the same? Well, this all obviously ties back to that fourth wall theory where we've discussed multiple times about how it's more likely than not that Momo, Lucky, and at least a few of the other characters are aware of the fact that they're video game characters. I genuinely can't think of another possible reason that Momo and Lucky are the only ones staring at the player's gameplay while the other players just stare at the people making the Pani Puri, who we're playing as. 
Who knows, maybe there's some other reason that I'm not seeing. Like, maybe it's just that they're cats and are probably more curious than humans, which could be the case. But if anything, they're just setting the fact that Momo and Lucky are the ultimate all-knowing beings of the Doodleverse. Their last two appearances both have to do with ordering food, which also established them as the renowned foodies of the Doodleverse as well. One of the most liked comments on part one of the Google Doodle lore was T. Jones 9097, pointing out that in the original concept for the Great Ghoul Duel, where a team of cats and a team of ghosts would fight each other, there's actually an imposter on each team. On the orange team of cats, there's a ghost wearing a cat ear headband, and on the blue ghost team, there's a black cat with blue eyes wearing a sheet like Jinx did in Jinx's Night Out. I don't think that there's really any major lore implications for this, but it's another one of those little details that shows how the ghosts and non-ghosts are definitely getting along better than they were before. They're fighting each other still, but it doesn't seem like there's any actual animosity, because this is just a friendly, fun competition. Another comment pointed out that the cat in the upper right corner has red hair and a broken wand, which seems like a pretty clear reference to the famous Ron Weasley from the Harry Potter universe. A few of the other ghosts have sunglasses and shutter shades as well, so maybe those are some of the more popular ghost fashion items out there. Speaking of shutter shades, can you think of another character that has some particularly bright shaped colored glasses? That's right, the Blue Witch. And this leads into the next theory. One of the comments that particularly stuck out to me was on the community post asking for lore, where a user commented that they believed that the Great Candy Cup Witches were actually the green team from the Great Ghoul Duel. I initially didn't really think about this too much, but the more I thought about it, the more these little details started to poke out at me. Like, Jade reading in the opening scene is exactly what the Green Witch is known for. Sage dons their iconic shutter shades, similarly to the Blue Witch. All of the cat ghosts is a cat, the one thing that the Yellow Witch is famously obsessed with. The only one who didn't really fit in was the Red Witch, whose entire personality is based off being a surface level jerk and wanting to win all the time. Not very similar to Kelly. Kelly doesn't match that description, but you know who does? Plum from the Purple Team. Plum is visibly more competitive and self-centered than the other ghosts, and even though we only see a few animations of each character, I'm getting the sense that if the witches and ghosts are in fact related to each other, then these two would be the perfect fit. It's also said that the Red Witch is secretly tender-hearted, which makes sense when we saw Plum with Jade the Green Ghost hanging out together. I'm still not entirely convinced that the witches and ghosts are the same souls at all, mainly given off the fact that Mama the Cat is in both the Candy Cup and Great Ghoul Duel games, but who's to say for sure? Going back to the Bubble Tea Doodle, I found a few interesting comments about the ghost being present in the Doodle, where I thought it was on the table tennis section of Champion Island. I mentioned that this proved that the ghost could visit areas that were completely abandoned, but then the comments pointed out that that might not necessarily be true. After all, out of all the regions of Champion Island, there's only one that has a notably lower amount of people than the rest. That happens to be, go figure, in the table tennis section. We have a reason that's given for this too. One of the side quest trophies that's given to Lucky is to try and figure out why the region is abandoned in the first place. And it all comes down to the Tengu, who's the ping pong champion before Lucky comes in and curb stomps him. We find out from an Inari in one of the houses that the villagers all left from the strong winds that were coming from the Tengu's fan whenever he played table tennis. The Tengu finally admits to Lucky that the whole thing was just a trick, and would be more than willing to stop if that meant everyone would come back. After this is done and Lucky goes back to the Inari, he tells her that the wind has stopped and the villagers are safe to return. You really are incredible, Lucky. And here's where I think there's that continuation from the Doodle Champion Island games to the Boba Tea. Nothing in the Champion Island games changes itself after Lucky completes the task, but the same can't be said for the Boba Tea Doodle. In the behind the scenes video that the Google Doodle's YouTube channel released to show some additional content, there's a few brief moments where you can see the plans for an alternative layout for the game clearly showing Lucky the Cat by herself, with Froggy standing in the background. There aren't any other visible characters, but somehow the area already looks a lot more vibrant and lively than it did in the Champion Island games. We also get to see some additional buildings in the background, and while they don't look quite like the area in the Champion Island games, my money's still on the village being located in the table tennis section of the island from the very, very prominent placement of bamboo and foliage around the area, and the rain which is seen in almost every single design for the duel as well. I'm still not quite sure why the rain ends after the dog is done serving all the customers, but it's up to interpretation for now. Speaking of designs for the doodle, there's a few alternate designs for the game's home screen, which shows the dog's shack at a different angle from the outside instead of the inside. This angle includes the customers of the game showing them from the back, and they're actually lined up in the order that we see them in the game, with the dog, sheep, froggy with the leaf above its head, and Momo and Lucky all standing out in the rain. Interestingly enough, the ghosts aren't seen. Is this important? No, but it's nice to see the characters some more. Keeping the topic on the bubble tea doodle, I saw a few people suggesting that the dog who we play as has a pretty strong resemblance to Momo's dog friend from Magic Cat Academy. I personally don't believe in this theory mainly because of the obvious design and color differences in the two dogs' respective designs, and the fact that it's almost guaranteed that the dog in the Magic Cat Academy games is a golden retriever or similar, while the dog we play as in the boba tea is a Formosan mountain dog. 
All right, let's move on from smaller details to a few more comments that I received about the lore from this community post and part one's comments. And there's plenty of them that mention one particular service that Google has, the Google Santa Tracker. The Google Santa Tracker technically isn't a doodle, but it is a website that's completely owned by Google. Santa Tracker is mainly used for holiday games in the month of December, but you could actually access the website year round. I had plenty of comments suggesting that there could have been possibly some hidden lore within the many, many activities of the website, but surprisingly and unfortunately, I don't think that there is any. After looking through every single game and animation that's available, I still haven't been able to find a single definite character, reference, or even mention of a Doodleverse character aside from the Google Maps guy who doesn't really count. There are dozens of games and numerous short films that are available, but I haven't seen any connections myself, and aside from the Google Maps guy, nobody else has seen any other connections with the Google characters either, as far as I could tell. The only other character in the Doodleverse that we know for sure appears in other products from Google is Froggy the Weather Frog, and none of his other weather app appearances are interactive for the most part. Speaking of Froggy, I managed to find one more doodle where he and Momo both appear, and this one's really easy to miss. The doodle is for Google's 19th birthday in 2017, officially called the Doodle Birthday Surprise Spinner. The doodle still appears when you look up his name today. It's essentially just a wheel of doodles, but for the main screen of the doodle, Momo and Froggy are both seen on separate birthday hats with Mama's wand being visible on the spinner itself. This is just another brief appearance of the two, even though they're not actual characters in it, technically. One of the earliest comments on the video came from EXDF, who's a member of the Champion Island speedrunning Discord as well. He had a few observations to make with one specifically regarding the Smart Kappa. A few people don't believe that there's anything special about it and that it's just really unenthusiastic about everything, especially sports, not existential. I mentioned this briefly before, but it's actually canon in the Champion Island games that the Kappas all know how to talk normally and are just speaking using the word Kappa as an inside joke unless Lucky joins the green team. The Smart Kappa is definitely not in on the joke. This one really long comment from Halo Sticks made me like particularly happy because it shows that there's just a few people out there who care about this little universe as much as I do. How does Momo the Cat close her eyes without closing her eyes? That's a good question. Map Hat wishes he could have the first video on Google Doodle lore. Also heads up for the inevitable game slash film theory on these. Map Hat, if you're watching this, I expect full revenue from your video. This user says that they're suspicious that the Boba Tea game specifically takes place on Champion Island and it was just kind of an aesthetic that was used by the developers, which I could definitely see and it's not 100% known or not if it's on Champion Island, but I'm assuming that it is for this video just because of those stone lanterns. If it was just the forest environment, like I could see it being somewhere else, but those little lanterns were pretty much the thing that set it in stone for me personally. A lot of the comments pointed out that the colors of the Google logo are also really prevalent, being the color of the Candy Cup Witches, Momo Spells, the Champion Island game teams, and even in a tiny cafe for the museum map of the Great Gould Duel. I like to think that the Yellow Witch casted a spell, either on purpose or accident, that gave Momo the ability to walk and talk. After that, Momo might have wanted to study magic like her Yellow Witch mother did and attend school. Also, if Momo can exist with the Yellow Witch, which very much looks like a human, I don't think humans and animal people coexisting is too far of a stretch. Did this man really go from a piano channel to a theory channel? Yes, yes he did. And with that, the Google Doodle lore is complete. Like in part one, going through the new and even deeper lore was quite the process, and I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get this video out earlier. On that note, I want to say thank you all once again for the insane support that part one and the channel got over the last few months. As far as the Google Doodle lore goes from here on out, I'm probably going to continue making shorts if there's any additional lore that's sprinkled throughout the universe, so be sure to check those out. I have a ton of other videos planned for the future, so if you're interested in those, please consider subscribing because not a whole lot of people who watched part 1 were actually subscribed to the channel. But in all seriousness, thank you so much for your support again. That concludes my time with the Google Doodle universe for now, and until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.